uh, we, we are a barrel tapped at both ends by uh, a, you know, an adage coined by Benjamin Franklin. There's a lot of issues facing our state. The issue that we're tackling at Rowan University is looking at an understanding of how development patterns are having a serious impact on the future of our state. Um, New Jersey has seen explosive amounts of growth over the last 30 years. And even with the economic uh, downturn in the economy, uh, most recently starting in 2008, we're still feeling development pressures. So we wanted to have a sense of how much development is still going on in a down economy. So to give you a little bit of the background of some of the research that we do here at Rowan, uh, we have uh, looked at the New Jersey land use land cover data set that's been developed for the entire state uh, at four different, uh, four different vintages. It was originally produced in 1986, and 1986 was really a key year in New Jersey state government. It was the, the year that the Mount Laurel Three case came into play, the State Planning Act was enacted. There's a lot of planning and development related issues that came into effect in 1986. So we had developed off of uh, half-toned mylars a land use land cover data set for the entire state of New Jersey back in 1986. And then with available funding in 1995, 2002, and 2007, we had the entire state reflown with aerial photography. And then after a considerable lag period, we would have a land use land cover data set. This land use land cover data set has, uh, it, it is the parent, uh, it, it's, there are so many data sets in New Jersey that could trace their lineage back to this land use land cover data set. And it's, it's incredibly robust. The most recent iterations of it in 2002 and 2007 are about 900,000 polygons for the entire state. It's got a minimum mapping unit of about an acre. So essentially, if you have a house that has cleared land around it that's about an acre in size in the middle of woods, your house get its, gets its own little land use land cover polygon. There are, diff there are 85 plus different land use types delineated in, in this. So there are forest types that are 50% crown closure versus less than 50% crown closure. And then that's split up between deciduous and coniferous and mixed forests. It's a very rich data set for doing, for doing planning work. The big problem that we have with this data set is that the lag time between the aerial photography from which this data set is derived to the actual delivery of the final G GIS data, the vector data, is typically years. The 2007 data set came out very quickly after the 2007 data was released, but that very quick period was still 2010. It was still a three and a half year period between the aerial photography being acquired and the land use being delivered. What you see here at left though is the New Jersey um, land use land cover delineated, but those bright red areas, the, the, the pinkish areas are urban lands, but the bright red areas are lands that actually transitioned to urban in 2007 at some point between 1986 and 2007. So this, these red areas on our map are the most recent areas that have experienced development, development in our state. Now, we use this data set almost every day with our research. We, we've used it to model patterns for exclusionary zoning within the state. We also do it at a statewide level, looking at just tracking changes of development over this 21 year period between 1986 and 2007. With the downturn in the economy in 2008, and with it occurring pretty much right after the 2007 uh, land use land cover data set, we now know we have a, a time period that when the next land use iteration, which is going to come out in 2012. We had the state, thanks to OIT's efforts, Sean McGinnis is here from OIT, OIT cobbled together about a million dollars to produce the 2012 aerial photographs that were flown in March 2012. We're waiting now for the land use land covered polygons derived from that data to be released. It's probably going to be end of 2014 at the earliest. So here at Rowan, we were thinking, how can we possibly get an understanding of the urban development that has happened in, since 2007? Even though there's a down economy, we, we realize, we recognize the fact that development hasn't stopped. But in a down economy, it's a very hard position to play in terms of policy to say that development is still an issue. You know, we want development to occur in the state, but we want it to, do, to occur in a sensible way. We don't want it to just be job creation or we need to restart the, the economy because in a down economy, policymakers are thinking we need to do something to stimulate the economy. We want it to be done in a sensible way. So we needed to have some sort of numbers before we could take any position on this. 
some sort of numbers as to how development that has occurred in this down period, how has it actually taken form in New Jersey? So what we put together as part of our NJ map project, thankfully we've received some funding from the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation to put together NJ map. It's the municipal asset profiler. So we're trying to take statewide data sets and make them usable to municipal governments. There's probably four municipal governments in the state of New Jersey that I can think of right now that actually have considerable GIS staff. And that's out of 565 municipalities. So many of our municipalities don't have any local level a considerable local level GIS or planning capabilities. It's either outsourced or to the county or to a consulting firm. So with NJMAP, we're trying to look at ways of having local level data compiled. And with this project of, uh, of exploring what kind of developments have occurred, we're trying to get, we're trying to build that data set first so that we can then anal uh, analyze it at the local level. So what we did was we put together a web viewer where in the very simplest of forms, we asked people to, if you see a building, click on it. And what we did was we presented the, the users with the 2012 aerial photography. And we masked out the 2012 aerial photography with the urban polygons from the 2007 data set. So essentially, all the houses that we knew were built in 2007 are blacked out on our map. And we can take a look at it real quick if you're interested. So this is the actual interface here this is the tool, it's live, it's a, it's a free site. You have to register for account just so that I can account for potential vandalism of point, putting erroneous points in there. But you can see here someone identified some, some points that appeared on the map, some houses that were built. If I click on the point, uh, one of my students actually, Brenna Leary, went onto the map and located these points um, a half mile west of, of Ewan, which is near Rowan University. And the reason you can find this is we have the, 20, uh, the 2012 imagery available, but the 2007 imagery available as well. So you can see that this was a farm field in 2007 and that this development has been much more recent. You can see at the time of this aerial photograph, uh, it was actually in process of being developed. All of this, this research has been on the incredible amount of contributions that have come from the community. Uh, we developed this application over the summer, and in uh, September 13th of, of this year, we released it. We gave a talk to the New Jersey Geospatial Forum and presented this project. So you can see here, this graph here is the total number of contributions per day. Uh, the Monday after the Friday we presented it, there was a groundswelling of people that came back to work and said that... I'm going to spend some time looking at the state and seeing what, what information is out there. This peak on the chart where there were about 3,000 points plotted per day, we had an event on campus where we asked students to sign up for an account and in a land rush try and map out as many things as possible within a given period of time. So those two extremely tall bar charts, the first one is my class where I let the cat out of the bag early and I told them to do some mapping. Um, which is a double-edged sword because if you're teaching a class and you tell students to go online to a web page and start clicking around, they, they stop paying attention to you, uh, which, is, which is okay. They were, they were helping out. But um, the interesting part of that was I had developed, a using Node.js, a real-time dashboard that I pulled up during class. So this real-time dashboard, as users would contribute points, there was a, a, I'll get to the back end of this, but essentially a Python uh, web.py web uh, script receives all of the uh, requests from the app. This is using Node.js and in real time to anyone connected to this page will push out updates. So as users were mapping, this would actually update with those maps. And I, I got creative. I found a, a website called Listen to Bitcoin where when Bitcoin transactions would go through, it would play a noise. So I'm in the middle of class lecturing and I'm saying this is good and you should contribute to this, not necessarily during my class. Uh, I had left this open and I start hearing ding, 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 and it's, it's students that were actually contributing to this project while I was, while, while I was lecturing. So it was, it was a little disruptive to hear dinging, but at the same time, it was, a, it was a very positive thing. And the students, I'm amazed at how much traction this got out of, uh, that I got out of this interface because the day of um, our mapping event, we had pulled this up on a large um, whiteboard uh, projector or smartboard in our department with the noises playing. 
And thankfully, our secretary didn't find the noises annoying because she would have probably killed me. Uh, she thought they sounded nice, so that was an extra win. But uh, the students really got excited over the fact that the, as they were, they were collaborating together, finding new development in, within the state, you could actually hear it and see it on a map in real time. So, and on the right here is just an animated GIF of all the contributions. So you see that ground swelling of points at the end where the entire state lights up. That was essentially our uh, October 7th, my class, and October 8th, the mapping event. So what have we actually found thus far? I have not quality controlled these points. And we could get into a discussion about authoritative versus crowdsourcing data. Um, I did try and do some quality control integrated into the Postgres database. Uh, I know that there are some parts of the state, like Wharton State Forest, where there is no new development. So the Postgres database actually has some triggers that says if a, if a person tries to add a point in Wharton State Forest or other preserved lands, it's going to tell you no. We know there is no new development in those areas. So don't try to add it. Uh, still, we have, as of last night, 19,385 points entered into the database. 17,000, almost 18,000 of those points are on non-urban lands because there's inevitably going to be some points that you locate that were actually part of you know, uh, a, a single family house that got lumped into urban, but it was surrounded by a farm field and an entirely new development comes in. There were some erroneous points that just got put in a town. One individual mapped out his entire town, which is great. Now I have points of every house in a town, but they're not new development points.